All right, welcome everybody. This is Eli Sagor uh, with the University of Minnesota. I'm here at the Cloquet Forestry Center today, and I'm really happy to kick off our 2020 webinar series. Uh, we, uh, the Sustainable Forest Education Cooperative, which is uh, where I work, teams up with the University of Minnesota Extension Forestry Group to offer monthly webinars uh, each year. And I'm really excited about this year's series. Uh, since you've registered and have joined us, I'm going to assume you know a little bit about it, and I won't bore you with a lot of details, but uh, all of those details are online on the Sustainable Forest Education website. Uh, and uh, as I said, I'm really glad to kick things off. Our first webinar of the, of the year is with Steve Wendell. Steve is with Voyagers National Park and the University of Minnesota. He's going to be talking about uh, beavers and watershed management. We hear a lot about beavers. We love them. We hate them. We um, uh, have all kinds of views on them, and we're going to learn a little bit more information about them today. Those of you who have tuned in and are interested in continuing education credits, uh, if you've been to our webinars before, you know the routine. If not, uh, just look for a link near the end of the presentation in the chat pod. I'll share that link and you'll have about an hour and a half uh, after the end of the webinar to complete the continuing education credit request form. And it occurs to me that for those of you in the room here, I have not got my sign in sheet. So I will get that uh, for you here. Uh, and without further ado, I will hand the floor to Steve. Steve, I'm gonna mute myself and you're on. Okay, thanks Eli. Uh, I appreciate you inviting me to give um, this webinar. This is my first webinar, so this is a little bit different format. Um, and uh, I will do my normal jokes and I'll have no idea if you guys are laughing, so you'll have to just fill me in at the end as to how they went. But um, So again, I, I've been a wildlife biologist at Voyagers National Park for about 17 years. Um, I also have an adjunct appointment in the Department of Fisheries Wildlife Conservation Biology at the University of Minnesota. Um, so thinking like a pond. All right, oh, hang on. Okay, this um, as I was thinking about what I wanted to talk about um, today, I thought um, about Aldo Leopold's famous essay, "Thinking Like a Mountain," um, uh, from 1948, and um, he wrote, "Only the mountain has lived long enough to listen objectively to the howl of the wolf." And basically, Leopold um, came to this realization after a long uh, early career of predator management and things that um, that the mountain, because it's lived so long and, and can sort of see things from from uh, a different perspective, it had learned that the wolf was important to its own health uh, by helping to regulate deer, for example, it would otherwise uh, overgraze the mountainsides, um, leading an overall decline in the ecosystem function of that mountainside. So by thinking like a pond, I'm, I'm suggesting the beaver pond has also come to appreciate the beaver for its role in maintaining the health of both itself and the ecosystem in which it exists. And that we as a society should similarly try to better understand how the interconnectedness of eco ecological systems benefits us all. So a little, a little uh, background um, on beaver natural history, again, I depending on my audience, I never quite know how much people really know about beavers, but obviously beavers are highly adapted to water. Uh, waterproof fur and their eyes located on the top of their head. They have a flat tail that acts like a rudder. Uh, they have membranes um, that close over their eyes, nostrils, ears, um, for obviously for swimming underwater, it really helps. Lips that close behind their teeth so they can still keep chewing while they're underwater. And those big webbed feet um, for propulsion. Again, obviously highly adapted to water. So beavers build dams to create ponds. Um, and this is kind of at the crux, I think, of, of a lot about what we'll be talking about today is this, this activity of beavers building dams. And beavers, um, beavers obviously, again, are highly adapted to water, um, but they don't just like any water, they really like stable water. So they build dams to essentially create stable water conditions that they can themselves regulate. So here's an example um, of a, that's a six foot tall human um, next to a, probably about a 10 foot tall dam here in Voyagers National Park. Some of these dams, again, can be very tall, multi-generational, um, sometimes hundreds of meters long. And this is a typical pond site um, that you'll find. Uh, here's the dam, backs up all this water upstream of the dam, 
There's the Beaver Lodge. There's the little food cache that they build um, to get them through the winter. Uh, beavers do a lot of digging of, you know, with canals, and there's some really been some really interesting work about um, how much beavers um, do by excavating canals and, and what the ecosystem functions of those are as well. So quickly, here again, here's the anatomy of a beaver lodge. Um, uh, one of the important things here is that beavers, again, part of the reason why um, they uh, build lodges um, is to give them protection from predators and from the elements. This underwater entrance here again um, essentially limits what kind of predators can get into the lodge. Um, that's where they go in the winter time or even in uh, basically all year round, they go in there to feed. Um, that's also where they'll have their kits and, and uh, raise their kits. Food cache again located right out front. Um, here's another little tidbit. Um, here in northern climates, um, water essentially acts as a heat source to beavers in the wintertime. So um, obviously the water that's under the ice is, uh, is above freezing, which is going to be a lot warmer than the ambient air. Uh, natural history again, just a few more little notes. Uh, beavers are highly territorial, uh, mostly monogamous, although again, this is um, an area of um, current study or, or, or further needed study as to how monogamous they really are. Um, they live in family groups, so this is almost always the breeding pair and their kits from that year, um, the kits from the previous year, and then depending on conditions, um, kits uh, or young from previous generations. So um, up to two, three, sometimes four or five years old in really dense populations, you can get delayed dispersal. Um, and one interesting note, so this is the North American beaver that I'm talking about, um, but the European beaver is a, is a different species. They actually can't interbreed because they have dis different chromosome numbers, but they're really very, very similar in ecology and behavior and physiology. Uh, this is quite obvious, I think, to most folks watching this webinar, beavers are herbivores. Um, you would be surprised at how many people think beavers eat fish, particularly um, uh, fishermen, but beavers do not eat fish. Um, beavers are herbivores. They also eat a lot of aquatic plants. This is an area of some research that we've done here in Voyagers National Park that I think uh, we certainly found surprising is um, beavers eating a lot of um, aquatic plants, both floating leaf and emergent plants, both in summer and winter. Um, so as a water adapted species, not surprisingly, um, wherever you have water, you're going to have beavers. And the range of North American beavers covers almost all of Canada and the U.S. except for those arid parts out west. And even having beavers down into the Rio Grande Valley of Mexico. Uh, the history of beavers in North America. So um, this, the photo in the background there is a, is a photo of, uh, or a picture, excuse me, obviously not a photo. Uh, a painting of, of the voyagers, the French fur traders that came um, starting uh, the fur trade in 1650 to 1690, uh, which really fueled most of the settlement and expansion of North America, both in the U.S. and Canada. And it was during this time that beaver abundance declined um, quite amazingly. Pre-settlement, you know, some, some estimates are that from anywhere from 60 to 400 million beavers occupied North America before the time of European settlement. Um, and through this uh, um, incredible amount of harvest that was taking place with most of these furs being shipped over to Europe to make uh, silk hats, um, um, that beavers were pretty much extirpated from most areas in um, at least Eastern North America by 1900 and certainly plenty of places out West as well. Um, don't have great estimates for the current population. Um, an estimate that was done in the late 1980s suggested anywhere from 6 to 12 million beavers in North America, and that's uh, certainly likely higher than that at present, although, uh, again, I haven't seen any more recent estimates. So um, what about more specifically the history of beavers in the Western Great Lakes? This figure is from a review paper that we did that just came out um, in 2018 in the North American Journal of Fisheries Management. Um, and so we tried to um, sort of build this timeline of what we think were, 
has happened with beaver populations, at least in a relative sense, um, since, um, since European settlement in the Western Great Lakes. So again, going from um, a population that was close to zero, you know, not many beavers left by the time you got to 1870 to 1900. Um, and then increasing quite dramatically up through the 1980s and 90s and then starting to tail off a little bit. So what this is a, a question that I get quite a bit is um, what do we know about beaver populations um, pre-settlement essentially or even before the fur trade era? Um, and unfortunately, we don't really have a great sense other than we know there were lots of beavers. Obviously, there needed to be lots of beavers around to be able to fuel um, the fur trade that was going on. But we don't, trying to put numbers on this is really difficult. What we do know is um, from some, uh, this is from a, a map that was done in early 1700, 1715. We actually have a little glimpse of what beaver societies might have been like. Um, Certainly quite advanced assembly lines, division of labor, construction of ramps it was like the lost city of Atlantis, but um, but we still don't know exactly how many beavers were here, but we can kind of make some guesses based on what we think sort of the, the landscape would have supported. And, um, and I would contend that um, uh, beaver populations pre fur trade are, would have been similar to what we are experiencing now um, not certainly not dramatically higher, and I don't think dramatically lower. And then again, during that fur trade era, they just um, they plummeted quite precipitously. So beavers as engineers, wrong kind of engineer. Okay, um, ecosystem engineers. This is a term that I think you all are familiar with, but um, specifically, again, um, states that. Um, an ecosystem engineer will create or modify habitats by causing physical state changes in biotic or abiotic materials. And, and, and I will point out that beavers um, certainly are only exceeded by humans, I think, in their ability to, to engineer landscapes. Elephants are also can do this in, in uh, savanna areas of sub-Saharan Africa. But other than that, it's pretty sparse company. Um, and another species or another um, term that I think folks are, have heard quite a bit, especially with reference to beavers, is, is the term keystone species. Um, and this is again a species with a disproportionate effect on its ecosystem whose removal can lead to collapse. Um, and this is um, obviously um, based on the keystone that you would find in the stone arch. If you were to remove that keystone, the whole arch will, will tumble down. So if we think about um, our own solar system, and where we where we sit in it, um, and considering again the the, um, the role of beaver as ecosystem engineer and keystone species, I think, and again I've I've looked at this a lot through telescopes. That if you look just right, again you can definitely see the outline of a beaver at the center of our solar system. I feel pretty safe in saying that. Um, and this is my uh, selfless or selfish promotion for for this little catchphrase that I've come up with: beavers are the answer to the question is irrelevant. So I think you'll, you, this theme will, will, um, will keep coming through here for the rest of my talk. Um, and I think that even the trees know that when a beaver comes by, they just, they just need to bow down. Um, so again, some of these ecosystem um, engineering feats that beavers can do, again, uh, the dams that they build obviously are, are what creates um, a lot of the dramatic effects that we see in the riparian ecosystems in particular. So they change hydrologic pathways in the water cycle, change geomorphology and sediment dynamics, uh, the distribution of woody debris, so carrying wood from the uplands down into, into wetlands and moving around within the wetlands themselves, and obviously increasing landscape heterogeneity quite a bit, which I'll touch on some more here. Um, we're lucky here in Minnesota in particular and in the Great Lakes that um, a lot of the seminal work that's been done on ecosystem effects of beavers um, was done right here in Voyagers National Park where I work. Um, Carol Johnson and Robert Nyman and John Pastor and a whole bunch of other researchers since the 1980s have been um, looking at this system to understand um, the effects that beavers have on a whole range of ecosystems. 
uh, services and functions. So this is, it, it presents this natural sort of experiment where um, as beavers were, were sort of recolonizing after 1900, um, th this is the Cabotoguma Peninsula in Voyagers National Park. This is a big, um, um, so essentially roadless wilderness area in the middle of the park. So 1940, again, very few beavers and only about 1% of the landscape was, was um, affected by beaver impoundments. So these are um, either ponds with water in them or um, uh, old ponds or beaver meadows, so essentially any sort of beaver influenced um, habitat type. And then as beavers uh, rebounded and, and increased to these really high densities um, that you would have had um, by the 1980s and 90s, now again, you can see quite a bit of, of stark contrast in, in the amount of influence that the beavers had on this landscape. So from 1% to 13% of the landscape in that 50 years, so again, influenced by beavers. So this is just that same thing in a time series, just again, to show you as the beaver population increased and that graph kind of shows the shape of that curve. All of these beaver ponds and associated habitats um, being created over that time span. And if I uh, summarize it in terms of the different wetland types, not surprisingly, um, there's a lot of the light blue is the actual ponded area and all these other um, habitat types are again, different beaver associated wetlands. So floating uh, meadow, wet meadow, flooded deciduous forest, saturated bogs, etc. But I think a key point here that I want you to take away is that um, most of this rapid change happened prior to 1960. And from that point on, things kind of leveled out a little bit. So again, if we're just looking at this sort of more generally, just in terms of ponds versus wet habitats versus moist habitats, again, it's the same the same obviously pattern that um, most of that rapid change that happened um, again happened in the first uh, in the colonization recolonization phase um, of, the, of the beaver population cycle. So this is um, um, just a, a little tidbit that I like to throw out there sort of as one of those gee whiz things to get people's attention but how much water is stored in beaver ponds? And this is something that we've been working on here at Voyagers more recently. Um, so um, we talk about the greater Voyagers ecosystem. This is kind of a term that we coined for our um, ongoing wolf project, but it, but it works in this case too. So 525 square mile area, um, that's including the park and about an equal amount south of the park. Um, and the surface area of beaver ponds here is 27 square miles. Or, 4.4 billion gallons of water. And when you start to put that into context, that, that would be the 10th biggest lake in Minnesota if you were to smash that all into one body of water. So um, it's quite impressive, again, how much water actually is being stored in, in beaver ponds. Uh, this is, again, some work um, from Carol Johnson's work. This is some of the favorite stuff that, uh, of hers that she did, I think, because it's just so unique and. Um, uh, but it's so in, provided a lot of insight as to what is happening um, in terms of both the rate um, and magnitude of the change that beavers are doing on the landscape. So um, the two key factors here. So each of these um, sets of lines are cohorts of ponds. So 1940 means these are the ponds that were created by beavers in 1940. And as they tracked through time um, and 48, 61, 72. So the two key points here are that uh, the mean pond size declined over time so that each new cohort of beavers that came um, and tried to establish ponds essentially were having to go to suboptimal habitats. All the nice big juicy spots were selected first and then as beavers continued to um, increase in population, um, other beavers would have to find smaller or spots to build dams that just created smaller ponds. And again, the other point here is that the rate of pond size increase also declined over time. So that by the time you get to 1972, those little ponds that they they dammed, they're not they don't have much of a chance to grow just because of the basically the geomorphology associated with those sites. Um, so this point, well, I'll, I'll bring this up a few more times in the rest of the talk about sort of what's happening um, during different phases of of the beaver population growth cycle in terms of the landscape effect. Uh, this is an ongoing project that we have um, with uh, George Host, 
um, at NRI. Sean Johnson Vice is a master student who, who worked on this, but um, essentially trying to replicate in some sense the work that um, was done at Voyagers in the, in the 1980s and 90s, but on five sub watersheds up on the North Shore, um, where we looked at photo sets from 1934 to 2017 and again delineated all active beaver ponds and um, all dams. So we're going to see some similar patterns to what we, was found in Voyagers, but it was just nice to do this to be able to replicate this and show that this is perhaps a more universal pattern. But um, you can see here that basically this is total water volume per, per unit area in each of these watersheds and they bounce around between photo sets. But generally the trend is that um, there wasn't a huge change over time in the amount of water that is being stored in ponds in these watersheds, in beaver ponds. By contrast, and this is a similar to what we saw in Voyagers, is that the total number of beaver ponds did continue to increase again as the beaver population increased and, and um, new, new colonies of beavers tried to set up shop in, in, um, in new areas. And so you, you combine those, and again, what you get is the average um, volume of ponds over time decreased in each of these watersheds. Sim again, a similar trend to what we saw um, from the work in Voyagers that Carol Johnson and others had done. Um, another point I will make here is um, the beaver activity creates a mosaic of habitats. And I think you could start to see this from some of the um, earlier time series that I show, but this is, this is um, a photo from 1940 from the northern side of the Cabotogama Peninsula. Again, you can see that's Ryan Lake on the left-hand side and then just mostly forest or bare rock. Um, and you fast forward to 2013, and again, now you have all of these um, either beaver ponds with withstanding water or, or beaver ponds that have, where the dams have failed, and now you have um, wet or dry meadows and different um, habitat types. Again, you can definitely see um, this mosaic that's been created with just by adding beavers, essentially. And here's another look at this, again, of this mosaic that you get of, um, of beaver dams and ponds and meadows. And even um, sometimes there's a very evident, I, I call it the bathtub ring of conifers that you get um, around beaver ponds where they've hydrated out all of the um, aspen and birch and other hardwoods that they prefer to, to uh, forage on. And what's left is the spruce and balsam and pines. And you can even see this mosaic at much smaller scales. This is, um, this is just a single beaver pond, but this is those clear areas, um, open areas here. This is from beaver, again, beavers clearing out the vegetation that's around their lodges and making their canals. Again, creating habitat heterogeneity even at this, um, at this pond scale. So I, now I'm gonna um, give you a few highlights of beavers as engineers of wildlife habitat. And this is again, I'm a wildlife biologist, so this is some uh, work that I've actively been doing. And this is summarized in a, in a book chapter um, in that same Carol Johnson book from earlier. Um, this is uh, again, beavers as engineers of wildlife habitat. And it's all summarizing basically what we've learned about, um, about this topic from Voyagers National Park over the last 50 years. Uh, moose is, is one that's been of high interest in the last 15 years in Minnesota as moose populations have, have been declining, wondering about what are beaver ponds or wetlands in general mean for moose. And moose definitely require heterogeneous landscapes for a variety of reasons. Um, this includes um, needing escape cover. So this could be um, in beaver ponds or any wetlands again, provide great escape cover from predators and from biting insects. Beaver ponds also provide some foraging habitat as moose um, eat lots of aquatic vegetation. And lastly, thermal habitat for moose, and this is um, can be both pro and, and uh, con, as you'll see in a second. But you know, if we think of ponds as being places where moose can go and cool off, uh, they certainly do that. But um, these open areas also have a different thermal signature for a big, large-bodied animal like moose. So we had, um, uh, there was a master student, Bryce Olson, who, who uh, I did this with, 
where we measured uh, operative temperature. So this is essentially modeling the temperature that that a, uh, a warm-blooded mammal would feel. Um, essentially incorporates ambient temperature with um, um, with humidity um, in this little black globe. It's called to give us a, a sense of operative temperature. So the ta the takeaway from this is that even though these ponds again have water where if a moose is submerged, theoretically could be um, cooling off. But then whatever part is not submerged is going to be subject to all of this intense solar radiation. And as you can see here, this is um, a little snapshot from a midsummer day, for example, in the middle of the day, an open beaver pond um, or any sort of beaver meadow without any forest cover is going to be as much as 14 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than you would be in a closed forest, for example. So if you're already a thermally stressed animal like a moose at the southern edge of its range, this can be quite significant. And when we model this over the entire landscape, again, you get this mosaic now, not of habitat types, but of thermal conditions. Um, and again, whether it's for moose um, or any other animal, this obviously has some implications, both, both pro and con. Um, I heard a couple of folks talking about beavers and wolves before the start of my webinar here, but um, maybe it's getting more well known that uh, wolves do prey on beavers quite a bit. Um, here in Voyagers, again, where we have really high beaver densities, um, as much up to 50% of wolf diet during the ice-free season can be comprised of beavers, which is which is a lot, um, and certainly higher than you'll find in other areas where there just aren't as many beavers. But um, and wolves we'll wolves use these beaver ponds and meadows as travel corridors, um, and there's probably also some incidental predation that happens on things like deer and moose, where beavers are actually in wolf um, in beaver habitats hunting for beavers an area of active research for us. Um, here's a wolf den um, in an abandoned lodge. Um, they are known to do this. Got some nice cute uh, photos of uh, wolf pups being reared in, a, in an abandoned beaver lodge. Uh, this is another area of active research that, um, that we just started last year is trying to understand um, how muskrats use beaver lodges. So, it's been sort of known for a while that muskrats will occupy old beaver lodges or even lodges that um, they can cohabitat with beavers, but we've been amazed at uh, how frequent this happens in more than 50% of the beaver lodges that we have here in Voyagers. And we have a lot, um, about a thousand, that more than half of these have muskrats also living inside of them. So here's, you can see their muskrat dragging a piece of vegetation down into the lodge. Um, just to, again, quickly summarize sort of what we learned about um, beavers as engineers of, of wildlife habitat. Uh, all seven species of bats in Voyagers National Park we've documented using beaver ponds. Uh, and bats like these openings over, they like to forage over water because um, that's generally where insect abundance is highest. And obviously any of the dead trees that, that happen from beaver flooding are also great spots for roosting, um, for, uh, for tree roosting bats. That exfoliating bark, again, is great spots for them to, uh, to roost in. Similarly, woodpeckers and cavity nesters like all of these dead trees um, for feeding and for nesting. Here, uh, this is an interesting thing that we've noticed here. Um, great blue herons, so, of the bird monitoring that's been done at Voyager since the park was established in, um, in 1975, that all 31 of the rookeries inside Voyager's National Park have been in, in beaver ponds. So essentially beavers come in and they'll flood um, lowland timber like black ash in this case. And uh, this is perfect habitat for great blue herons. Similarly, ospreys, 83% of our osprey nests have been in beaver impoundments. So this is, you know, for these two species in particular, this is where that the concept of keystone species might become a little bit um, more relevant, where if you were to remove the beavers from this landscape, would we actually have herons and osprey, or we certainly wouldn't have as many. Um, and if we think about just, you know, bird habitat in general, you know, any of these ponds have different, different um, 
uh, zones and um, that you can think of as providing different habitat for different species, whether it's those standing dead trees in the middle of the pond I was just talking about, or the littoral zone where you have submergent uh, floating leaf vegetation, the shrub zone along the margins of the pond or emergent zone or beaver meadows. Um, and we've documented about 30% of the breeding and visiting bird species in Voyagers we've documented using beaver ponds or any of these various portions of beaver ponds. So in summary, um, what we found is that um, 124 terrestrial vertebrates, this doesn't include fish, obviously, we, we documented using beaver habitats and, um, and that's almost 40% of the extent vertebrates. So, um, and some might say that, um, well, these are just animal birds that, um, or any of these vertebrate species that just use wetlands, which is true. Um, but again, if we go back to this context of, of the sheer volume of these wetlands that the beavers have created on this landscape has had to have had a significant effect, not only on the diversity of vertebrates that we have here, but also the abundance at, at the scale of the park. So I'm gonna shift gears here a little bit. Um, and again, now talk a little bit about the work we've done on some population dynamics. Um, again, here's going back to that graph about the history of beavers in the Western Great Lakes. And we got to thinking about, you know, we know sort of these longer term trends, but we started thinking about what are the shorter term trends in beavers and what caused, more specifically, what causes beavers populations to fluctuate, especially on shorter scales like um, interannual time scales. Um, and not to get too far in the weeds here, but um, po animal populations are affected by density dependent and density independent variables that can influence both the size of the population or either the direction or the magnitude of those fluctuations. Um, so density independent ones would be things like weather and climate, resource availability or predation, human harvest, for example. Density dependent are ones that, um, again, and I'll explain this a little more in the next slide, would be also sometimes could be predation. Disease is clearly one that's density dependent, resource competition, territoriality. So density, negative density dependent, so population growth rates decline as a population size increases. And this is that classic um, graph that, that you may all have seen before um, about carrying capacity. So that essentially as an animal's population increases, it growth rate starts to slow until it basically levels off and essentially you know, won't exceed carrying capacity. In reality, it tends to just fluctuate around um, that carrying capacity. But, um, and again, carrying capacity is the maximum population, population size and environment can support. So we had some data from Minnesota DNR was doing annual surveys of a whole bunch of routes across Northern Minnesota from starting in 1975 and then they quit uh, doing it in 2002 for budget reasons, which is unfortunate. But so we had this great time series of, of beaver abundance data from almost the northern one third of the state that had never really been looked at. Um, and you can see the routes, again, distributed quite widely across the, the northern one third of the state. Um, and we wanted to understand how things like habitat quality, um, fur trapping, or the intensity of, of fur trapping. Uh, predation by wolves and also weather uh, variables had on interannual fluctuations in beavers. Again, what is trying to understand really what is drives beaver populations either to go up or down in successive years. So now I'm going to skip over all of the all of the uh, meat of the methods and statistics, trying it through this rotary engine. Um, and so what, what this graph is, this is just um, a, the time series of each of these 15 different routes. And the only takeaways I want you to get from this is that um, they all went up and down over that time frame, uh, but the synchrony of them wasn't always the same. So not surprisingly, um, a population, whether a population was trending up or down in the Northwestern part of this, um, over in the Red Lake area, for example, would be different than down in Pine County or up on the North Shore. And similarly, um, the abundance of beavers within each of these subpopulations is also different. So sometimes by a factor of, of two or three. So if we think about this again, take all of this data, 
to sort of summarize it, and we get this um, average beaver population growth for the entire one third of the state of Minnesota over this time period. And what this showed us is again, is that the beavers were growing, again, above that red line means population growth up through about 1990, and then again, started to decline. And again, this mass matches what, what we sort of were speculating was happening um, in the more current era. So conclusions from this population work that this is a, a manuscript that's currently in revision at ecological applications. I'm hoping this will be out in the next couple of months. But the, again, beaver populations in Northern Minnesota appear largely self-regulated. Density dependence was the main thing that was driving um, population um, changes. Not exactly what we were expecting. Um, historically intensive trapping obviously nearly extirpated beavers from North America. Um, but whatever harvest or predation levels have been happening in the last, uh, since 1975, don't seem to be having much effect on beaver populations, um, at least in the short term. So again, we this the study found um, that predation was not a significant factor um, in terms of regulating uh, beaver populations. We have found, this is a student, Tom Gable, who's a PhD student at the University of Minnesota, um, has learned as part of some of this amazing work that he's been doing, is basically learning how wolves hunt beavers. Um, and basically wolves normally are thought to be chase predators. So again, whether chasing deer or moose or caribou or elk, uh, they'll just run them down until they get tired. But in the case of beavers, they take a totally different strategy and they're, they're now ambush predators and they'll just sit downstream of a dam or a lodge or on a feeding trail and just sit and wait for hours and hours for a beaver to wander by. It's quite the events. It's really been fun to, to work on uh, with Tom on this. Um, and this is a video. This is like the only video evidence there, ever, there is anywhere of how wolves attack and kill a beaver. You can find this on YouTube if you want to watch the whole thing. But that's a uh, wolf weighs about 50 pounds and that beaver probably weighs 30, 35 pounds. So um, certainly a full grown adult beaver is gonna be pushing 60 pounds and that's, um, they're not as easy to kill as one might think. But again, how do wolves affect beaver populations? As, as I hinted at, uh, we don't think um, that they really are having a, a significant effect. So we, we had one little case study in Voyagers where we had, we estimated for one pack of wolves, how many beavers they killed in a single season. And we did this by going to find every kill site that the wolves made in that, um, in their territory in that one year. And we estimated they killed 80 to 90 beavers. Um, but next year, the population within that, um, within that wolf pack territory actually increased by 43%. So, not only did it decrease, it actually may have stimulated some growth. Uh, okay, um, similarly, this is another area of, of research that ties again back into population cycles that I thought would be relevant for you, is um, we've learned in these water dominant landscapes like we have here in the Western Great Lakes that beavers can disperse a long ways. This is, I'm gonna show you two quick case studies here of where a beaver um, moved from its original capture location that's in the orange and then swam either up or downstream and went up a river before it was um, legally killed by a recreation trapper and they returned the tags to me, but um, so we could retrace its path essentially, but this is 62 kilometers by water, 36 kilometers uh, straight line distance. Here's another one that went the opposite way, um, 76 kilometers by water, 41 kilometers uh, straight line. The record that I have that I won't show you, but um, was went downstream 160 kilometers, long ways. Um, and so when we summarize this um, for all of the beavers here in Voyagers, what I found is that um, that beavers, essentially this protected area of Voyagers has this out, sort of outsized influence uh, on the landscape around it by essentially becoming this artesian well of beavers that we can that will disperse from the high density population in the park into these outlying areas. So the thing that I find I think is relevant to this kind of conversation we're having today is that beaver dispersal, again, if you remember, I talked about this at the beginning is 
Um, they tend to delay dispersal in dense populations. So this is where uh, we had the highest dispersal rate is when the beaver population was relatively lower back in 2013-14, uh, um, when most of the um, of these long distance dispersal events were happening. And then more recently, the dispersal has really dropped off as beaver populations have spiked here more recently. So what this creates um, at this um, at this sort of scale that of the park is that we have these pulses of beavers that were getting pumped out into the landscape. Um, and it's not a continuous high rate, but it's gonna go ebb and flow as the beaver population goes up and down. And again, the relative influence that this protected area of high high density beavers has on the outside outlying landscape certainly is gonna fluctuate again over time as depending on where we are in that beaver population cycle. Okay, I'm gonna change gears again here now. And I apologize to those folks in the room who may um, come from uh, the forestry side of things, because I'm gonna, I'm not gonna spend obviously as much time talking about sort of the human wildlife conflicts as I have been on the sort of on the ecosystem service side of beavers, but um, we definitely know beavers, again, create lots of issues um, when, they, when they interact with human society. Uh, damage to road systems and culverts, lost acreage, uh, that's timber acreage to flooding and cutting, or even uh, losses to ornamental plants and things on people's um, private properties, all of the expense that goes with nuisance beaver trapping. Um, and not surprisingly, these conflicts, the number of conflicts rise and fall with changes in fur prices. So like now, um, when fur prices are really low, like historically low, it's really hard to find trappers to even wanna to bother to go out and trap beavers. Um, and essentially you, you come into a sort of a bounty system where you'd have to pay people extra to go and trap beavers. And this last statement was from a conversation I had with, a, with a, somebody who works in the commercial forest industry about that they certainly appreciate and understand the positive impacts that beavers have on biodiversity or providing ecosystem services. But he just acknowledged that it all comes at a cost and trying to balance that is, is, um, is obviously at the crux of a lot about what we're talking here today about. Um, so I'm gonna, I think I'm doing okay on time. So um, this is uh, another, some more work that I did with that student, Sean Johnson Vice where we looked at this contentious issue of beaver trout interactions. And for the Western Great Lakes, this is um, certainly an issue um, that again, um, creates some uh, strong feelings from folks, um, but feeling like beavers are generally a negative um, influence on recreational um, fisheries, stream trout fisheries in particular. Um, but out West, for example, where um, they're really actually trying to promote um, beavers to enhance uh, salmon populations and trout populations in these high gradient streams. They like to, um, to remind people of this Native American phrase of um, that beaver actually taught salmon to jump. But so this is uh, again a review paper that was out in North American Journal of Fisheries Management. Um, so we summarized what we knew about beaver trout interactions in the Western Great Lakes. And the negative effects of beavers on trout could, could be summarized as, um, again, the siltation that you get, which covers up a gravel substrate that's needed for spawning. Um, obviously upstream barriers to migration. This generally is not a problem for fish moving downstream. They just go over the top of the dam, but um, depending on the height of the dam and the size of the fish, they can sometimes have issues of getting over these dams. Um, certainly, um, increases in water temperature. Um, and this happens, you know, when you create a dam and pond up that water, now it sits and it can warm up faster. Also any of the cuttings that happen on the bank are reducing shade. Um, there's also a decrease in stream flow and velocity that can happen, um, which can redu reduce dissolve oxygen and some other effects. So there definitely are um, negative effects of beavers on on stream trout, there's no doubt about it. Um, but these are sometimes overlooked, uh, the positive impacts, and these are generally associated with the ponds themselves, where those ponds can moderate fluctuations in water temperature downstream of the ponds. There's generally um, 
find a, an increased catch rate and increased um, size of fish that you find in these in beaver ponds versus the stream portions themselves. And these ponds can act as overwinter refuge, important areas of overwinter refuge. Um, especially again, if there's enough dissolved oxygen and there's and the, um, there's some open water in the bottoms of these ponds. And generally those positive effects of these, of these ponds really only last for the first two to four years after they're created. And not surprisingly, these benefits of beavers certainly are much higher in higher gradient streams than low gradient streams. Um, okay, here's the last little bit. I think again, I'm doing just fine on time, but this is how I'm gonna sort of try to summarize my views on some things. And, um, and again, thinking about this in terms of watershed management and, and um, where beavers sort of fit in the big picture. Um, so if we think of ecosystem services that are provided by beavers, they, they increase with beaver abundance. So generally the more beavers you have, the more ecosystem services you're gonna have. And whether this is a truly a linear relationship or it's curvilinear or whatever it might be is, um, uh, is some nuance that we won't have time to get into necessarily, but at the same time that if you have more beavers, you're gonna have more of these ecosystem services that we've been talking about. You also have more opportunities for these human conflicts to happen. So there's the trade-off, right? The more ecosystem services, the more conflicts you have. And so if we think about this, again, finding balance is ideally, I think everybody would agree that if we could have lots of ecosystem services provided by beavers with few uh, conflicts, that's great, everybody wins, but that's probably um, pretty rare to find a situation like that. And certainly the opposite would be where you don't get much benefit from beavers and all they do is create conflicts, maybe in a highly urbanized area, for example, if, that, if this was perhaps one scenario where you may find that. Um, and this relationship, again, certainly is gonna change depending on how the density of people or the amount of development that you're gonna have in an area, as I suggested. So an area like Voyagers National Park that has a very low, uh, almost no people and no development, um, we can afford to just um, have lots of beavers and maximize the amount of ecosystem services they have. Um, whereas again, in a sort of a higher density area, that's gonna be a little more challenging. So, all right, I think I'm doing just fine on time here. I just have a couple of, slides to wrap up. So I think I've made the case here that beavers provide a lot of ecosystem services. I hope some of what I presented is new information for you. Um, I've given variations of this talk before and certainly lots of this stuff has been published and um, in lots of the review papers that have been done, but hopefully there's a few new tidbits that you took away from this. Um, I think my position on this is certainly pretty clear, but, um, but I think it's important to recognize again that um, maximum beaver populations do not necessarily mean maximum ecosystem services. And I'm going back to those earlier slides where I talked about, um, depending on where you are in the growth curve of beavers, um, may, you may be able to optimize the amount of ecosystem services you get with, with um, a smaller beaver population size, for example. And it will depend on what you're talking about. If it's talking about total water volume, is different than number of um, aquatic patches, for example, from a purely wildlife habitat perspective. Um, another point here is that if your goal for whatever scale you're managing at, if your goal is to have more beavers in this part of the world, um, beavers will do just fine and increase on their own um, without much help. Again, this is different than what's going on out west where they're actively moving beavers around and restoring them to previously um, areas that, uh, where they've been extirpated. And if the goal is less beavers, this is where it gets a little more challenging. Certainly at the local level, um, beaver dam removal um, or, or intensive trapping, such as you know is happening in the Knife River on the North Shore, for example, can be effective. But if you look at, at the scale of, for example, the Northern third of the state of Minnesota, um, there, there are not a lot of great uh, options out there for trying to regulate beaver populations at that scale, especially when, again, the fur market just isn't doing what it needs to do or is it not an incentive on its own. So, and a sort of a, a corollary to that would be thinking about um, if we wanna 
protect and promote these ecosystem services that beavers provide. Again, think about water storage or wildlife habitat or, or um, any of the number of things that I've talked about. There may need to be some incentives that are provided to whoever um, you want to, um, to protect or promote those ecosystem services. Essentially, you might have to, have, you might have to pay for it in some cases. Um, the last point I will make here is about landscape context matters when thinking about um, where to maintain castropogenic, and I just, I just created that term about an hour ago, I'm very proud of myself, castropogenic ecosystem services. So because, again, beaver populations, both in density and in um, uh, whether they're increasing or decreasing, can vary across whatever landscape you're looking at. And for example, these five watersheds on the North Shore beaver populations, they're all different in all five of them, and they don't, they're not all in synchrony as to whether they're increasing or decreasing. And where you are in proximity to a population, whether you're next to a population that's high or whether you're next to one that's low, will obviously have some relevance to what it is that you might be trying to do at that particular, um, on that landscape in terms of management. So I, want to, I do want to thank all of these various um, funding sources for that have funded a lot of this work over the years. Sean Johnson Vice, again, the master's student who finished up um, last fall has been at the center of a lot of what I presented here today. Tom Gable, the PhD student, um, a couple other students, Bill Seerud and Bryce Olson had also worked on some of these um, projects um, over the years that were presented here in this presentation. So I will leave you with this last little quote. Um, from Leopold as I was reading um, Thinking Like a Mountain, I came across um, one of his other essays where he talked about um, intelligent tinkering. And I think a lot of people are familiar with this, um, uh, this saying by him, to keep every cog and wheel is the first precaution of intelligent tinkering. And um, beavers certainly um, seem to be involved in a lot of different cogs and wheels um, through, through their activities and so, um, in some sense, you can get a lot of bang for your buck by um, um, thinking about beavers in that sense. And with that, I am happy to take any questions. It's 12.54 right now. All right, Steve, thank you very much. Uh, that was a really good presentation. I've got, I think, four questions here. One that came in early on. Uh, you mentioned that you didn't have, uh, or we, we don't have uh, records of populations uh, before I don't know, not too long ago, I don't remember exactly what era, but a, a question came in about what about looking at, uh, I think it was European import records and sort of comparing that with what we know about habitat suitability. Is that a data source that might be informative? Uh, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so that's been an active thing that people have been doing for a long time, um, looking at fur trade records from, uh, from the Hudson Bay Fur Company or the Northwest Fur Company, all of these. And so we can certainly get some sense of how many furs um, left or were trapped from a certain area and were shipped overseas. But that doesn't uh, still doesn't give us a great sense for how many beavers were there to begin with. So um, it, it provides some information again to know that there was, it certainly confirms that we know there were lots and lots of beavers here during the fur trade era, but we still, um, it doesn't, it only paints sort of a blurry picture as to what we really think um, was, you know, the abundance at that time. But, you know, again, I think some sort of modeling exercise is probably the best way to, you know, to try to refine that and get put some estimates with some confidence intervals around them. Hey, Steve, uh, we've got two questions that I, I think are similar, if I'm uh, familiar with the items. Uh, can you comment on beaver deceiver pipes? And also, uh, do Clemson levelers work? Any comments on either of those? Yeah, right. Those are the same thing. Beaver deceivers and Clemson levelers. Um, they definitely work. Um, and there's all kinds of different designs. If you go on the internet, you can find a YouTube video of somebody who's, who's tweaked that original design um, and uh, for different landscapes or different habitat types. But generally, it's a very relatively low cost, non-lethal way to deal with, with issues of flooding. So 
um, I think they're utilized quite a bit and it can be very successful with the caveat that they need some maintenance because you got to keep the beavers from, you know, sometimes they clog up the intakes on them. Great. Uh, kind of a long one here from uh, uh, up north. Uh, not sure if we'll have room for questions or comments. I thought I'd post something. Anecdotally, I've seen riparian forest management issues related to beaver, particularly with respect to aspen and birch regeneration. Based on what we know about beaver and what we've heard here, should we be focusing harder on managing for diverse, longer lived forest in our riparian areas? Um, I, I think so. Um, I've, I had a conversation with a friend of mine who's a, a fisheries manager recently was asking about, you know, what kind of stuff should he be planting um, in these areas where they're trying to restore um, stream trout habitat. Um, and he was asking if she should be planting trees that are, you know, are not palatable to beavers. Um, and that certainly um, was a strategy, but unfortunately, you know, the rather expensive and time consuming to be planting only stuff that beavers are not going to eat and still, again, provide the other things that you want to have in that stream corridor. So, but I think in general, um, I think that would alleviate a lot of the problems if you could slightly diversify the forest there um, along these riparian areas for a variety of reasons, but perhaps it'll be slightly less um, suitable for beavers. Although again, they're a generalist who eat all kinds of stuff. So um, just because there's no aspen and birch there doesn't mean you're still not gonna have beavers. It just might not be at the same densities. Great, and I, I think what we're gonna do here, I've just shared the links to uh, uh, request continuing education credits. So anyone looking for those links, you'll see them in the chat pod. And also a short uh, feedback form. We'd appreciate feedback from anyone who wishes to provide it. And with that, I'm gonna say, I think we'll go a couple minutes after one o'clock. Steve, I'm not sure what your schedule is like, but I am seeing a couple of other questions. If folks need to move on, uh, that's just fine. Uh, uh, but why don't we keep working through these? Uh, any research on climate change as it relates to beaver populations nationally? Nationally, not really. Um, there's been some work that was done in uh, Quebec a few years ago where they were kind of trying to model at, bit, at the scale of, of the province of Quebec, um, how climate, climate affects beavers and how that may affect beavers going forward. Um, there's been some work looking at beaver expansion in the Arctic, again, is, which is being driven by climate change. But otherwise, not really. Again, beavers are a little tricky because they're, they're such a generalist um, in terms of uh, what they eat and where they can set up shop. As long as you have any water, you're gonna have beavers. And so, um, but it's certainly an area, again, I think makes total sense that if we do think there's gonna be changes in the water cycle in various parts of the country that whether you have more or less water is certainly going to have impacts on um, on where uh, where you have beavers as well. All right. Uh, what about the impacts of beavers on interior forest birds that don't need edges? Maybe this one is thinking back to that uh, the two maps or the satellite images or old, old aerial photos that you showed. Uh, thinking about oven bird and pileated woodpecker and similar species. Okay. Um, I guess I'm not exactly sure of what the link might be other than, again, when you have beavers creating these mosaics of habitats and uh, sometimes flooding, again, standing forest, um, it certainly is gonna be creating or changing habitat and for certain things like oven birds, it's gonna be worse. But um, I guess without more context, I'm not sure I can answer that question very well. Great. Um, Sorry. You had some great uh, video of wolves and other things and muskrats and so on. And maybe you've got video for this one. How tall of a beaver dam can trout cross upstream? Do you know? Uh, it's gonna vary by species. Again, I think if you go out west, um, they it doesn't seem to be a real problem because uh, you know again, salmon and trout, those are all really high gradient mountain streams that those species are adapted to and they're really good jumpers. Um, if we get here in the Western Great Lakes where we've got uh, brook trout and um, uh, and steelhead, which is which is a non-native, but I don't think they're quite as adept at jumping. So a couple of feet, probably. Again, I don't actually have a, a number off the top of my head. No, but I don't know if anybody's 
really rigorously looked at what the jumping ability is of our, our brook trout here. Uh, Steve, I'm only seeing one more question. We'll see if any others come in, but do you think, this is a good question. Do you think that the shift from conifer dominated forest to more aspen and birch in Northern Minnesota has helped to increase the beaver population? Yeah, so that's that's um, what I was trying to get at when I showed that timeline of, of what I think has been happening with beaver populations going back um, before the fur trade area, again, before the forest would have been changed. So um, one little caveat that I would give to that, because the easy answer is that we have more aspen and birch, we must have more beavers. The one caveat I would give is Voyagers National Park has not had any real disturbance since um, uh, the big fires in 1936 and then some, um, some pulpwood logging that happened up through the end of the 1960s. So almost all of the forest that's in Voyagers National Park is um, at least 50 to 90 years old and there's certainly some of these stands that are older than that. So it's not what I would call young forest by any means. And again, we have the highest beaver densities in, um, in, in the United States or in Voyagers National Park. So, um, so that's where I come back to. I don't, I don't think our populations now are any higher than they were before. I think, again, they're sort of, they sort of have, this is the maximum extent that they can have. And a lot of it's driven by water availability and geomorphology and the food is maybe not quite as important as we used to think it was. Well, I don't see any additional questions and I don't think we have any here. There was one uh, comment uh, from here in Cloquet. Uh, I, I did not pass along part two of a question from earlier about the Clemson levelers. Uh, the question was, does the Moose Lake Correctional Facility still make and sell them? Someone in the room here in Cloquet said, no, they don't do that anymore. So you'll have to find another source for those. Uh, with that, I'll remind you that uh, if you're interested in continuing education credits, if you're at a broadcast site, look for the sign-in sheet. If you're here in Cloquet, I'll just do one up. Our, I tried to print it and our printer's broken. So uh, we'll just do one on our own. If you're watching online, um, uh, look for the URL that I posted just a moment ago in the chat uh, pod and uh, do request those credits. Uh, that's, that's, how, uh, that's how you get them. Steve, I want to thank you again. Really, a lot of interesting tidbits, as you said, a lot of good information and, and uh, a great presentation. Good photos, too. I always appreciate good photography and presentations, and you had a lot of it. So thank you very much for taking the time to do this. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, our next webinar will be about a month from now. Uh, Marcella Windmuller Campioni from the Department of Forest Resources at the University of Minnesota is going to talk about uh, site selection and the importance of uh, microsite variability uh, in uh, species replacing